Good evening. Uh, let me give myself some volume. Good evening and welcome to the Living Water live stream Bible study. Praise God. My name is Bernadine Warmly Daniels and it is my privilege to once again join you for a study in the Word of God. The Living Water live stream Bible study is a ministry of Soterios Ministries Incorporated, which is um, an independent 501c3 that I founded years ago, all the way back in February 14th, 1991. And so um, we love the Word of God. Um, our mission is the salvation of the souls of men. We are partnering with God to bring salvation back, to make it um, something that is important once again, um, not only in the church, but for people in the world who desperately need an encounter with the living Christ. Amen. So grab your Bible, grab your notes. The notes are... Um, of course, on my Facebook page, they were there last week. I reposted them just a few minutes ago. Um, we will be continuing in a study um, through John, John's Gospel. That'll take us a while when we get to it. First, second, and third John, John's epistles that he wrote um, to the church and Jude. Um, so we started with the book of Jude. That's what we'll be picking up again today. Okay, so as you come in, um, say hello. Let me make sure that my comments, oh, there we go. Uh, good evening to Canada, my friend Kathy over in Canada. Good evening to Paulette and her husband and their ministry. Good evening, Beverly. Praise God. As you come into the, the room, go into the comment section and say hello. Let me know that you're out there. Praise God. Oh, just one quick announcement. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow, um, I will be teaching um, for a couple of Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. for uh, my friend, Pastor Gloria Wilder, um, her church, Faith Tabernacle. Um, it will be on Facebook Live. It will be on their Facebook page. So you'll have to um, go to Faith Tabernacle uh, Worship Ministries, Faith Tabernacle Worship Ministries. You'll see there's a post on my Facebook page giving you the information. They've been doing a study on the fivefold ministry. She asked me if I would teach on the pastor, the fivefold gift of pastor and teacher. So I'll be doing that for the next couple of weeks. And if you want to sit in on that, there is a conference call number where you can just come in and listen through the conference call, or you can view it on Facebook Live, but it will be, that's tomorrow, it will be on Faith Tabernacle's um, Facebook uh, page, okay? Unless I do something real savvy, like on my iPad, have it go on my page, and on like my computer, have it streaming on um, uh, their page. I don't know if you can do that, so I don't wanna mess it up. So just look for it tomorrow, okay? If you want more information on the fivefold ministry, you know, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, what are these gifts? I'll be talking about pastor, teacher tomorrow. Okay, let's pray and we're going to jump in. I've got a couple of things I want to share with you and then we're going to press on through um, um, again with Judah, otherwise known as the book of Jude. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege you give us of coming together in your presence across regions um, and different states, different nations, um, to break open the bread of life, to drink deep from the life-giving rivers 
of the water that flows so freely from the throne of God. Thank you, blessed Savior. Holy one of God. Holy one of God. Thank you, Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We bless your name tonight. We invite you to brood over the top of this Bible study, impart wisdom and revelation, strengthen us in the faith. I pray that we would have aha moments let the seals be broken off of the word of God, that we might um, not only know about the word, but know the, the word, intimately have a relationship with you through your word and through prayer. So thank you, Jesus. It's a blessing to represent you, to serve your kingdom and your people. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. We increased. Um, as you come in, um, comment again. I have been having problems with the um, comment sections. All viewers can participate. Yes. Comment display. Hide profile pictures. Choose whether to show profile photos next to comments. Hmm. Replies and reactions on comments will still appear. Uh, no, open that. Okay, I don't know. Um, expand comments. Uh oh, okay, there we go. Okay. Okay. All right, I think that did it. Okay, so. Before we jump in, good evening to Catherine. Good evening, Faith. Um, good evening to Susie, um, my aunt um, Mary and my cousin Mary. Hey, and my cousin Vivica, Dr. Vivica Eccles Kenner. Praise God uh, is in the room. Good evening to Sherry. Good evening, uh, Gwendolyn. Good evening, Christy. Good evening to my daughter, Shakaya. There's Sabrina. Good evening to Sabrina. All right, guys, listen. We, we got to get into Jude because we want to finish it up. So um, just real quick, um, as we do this, good evening to my friend, Farmer Ransom in um, uh, melting hot Arizona. <laughs> okay, listen. I am, we are, I have been using the Legacy Standard Bible just for this study, just to do something new, see how it flows. Legacy Standard Bible is a, is a um, update of the New American Standard Bible, which I love. So I thought I would try the Legacy Standard Bible. So for this study, I am using these Bible study notebooks, okay? You can order them like probably on Amazon. You can order them through um, uh, Christian books. And it is like, for instance, it's the gospel of, I mean, the, the um, epistle. It'll have the text. And then over here, it has lines. I don't know if you can see the lines for you to take your notes so that you can create your own scripture study notebook. So as you'll see, you go back in the back of this because this is 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Jude in this one small volume because these are all small books. You can see John's gospel is a, a lot thicker. But what I'm going to do is create my own study, study book or study Bible, okay? So for Jude, um, and basically all I'm putting in here is the information that's in your notes. So... I'm creating my own study guide, writing it, handwriting. There is something about the connection between your hand and the reticular activating system in your brain that makes the word go deeper. The word goes deeper when you write it down, okay? So I'm creating my own intro to the book of Jude with the notes that I gave you. So you have this information, you can do it yourself. And then as you go into the text, you can see um, the text and my notes and then also my notes on the side so that 
I can be anywhere, any place. If I happen to have this study guide on me, I can whip it out and teach or share with somebody anytime, any place. I am all for marking in your Bibles, taking notes. Get you a Bible that you can write in. Hello, Chu. God bless you. Um, good evening, uh, Tanya Garth. Good evening. Praise God. Okay. So I highly recommend these. I've got it also be just because I'm a bibliophile and I can't think of anything better to do other than spend a few bucks on, on books. Same thing. This is the New American Standard Version, but it's 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Jude. It's the exact same thing. It is a Bible study notebook. Okay. So after I fill this one up, who knows, at some point I might come back maybe in a year or two and do it all over again and just look for fresh revelation in this clean one. Or, I, you know, I, I could always give it away. Praise God. Maybe I'll do that. What's the name again? This is the Legacy Standard Bible. This is the Scripture Study Notebook legacy standard bible you can get it for all the books of the bible i just happen to have gotten it for these because this is what we're going to be studying you don't have to get the legacy standard you can get these things come in um all different um translations if you have a translation that you prefer um you know you can use that like this is the nasb but if you want to follow along with what we're doing, we will be using the Legacy Standard Bible. It just keeps the scripture fresh, keeps you on your toes, okay? All right, so let's jump in. All right, so let me turn off that music. Um, so we started with Jude. Um, if you want all of the preliminary information, you can go to my um, Facebook page. I think the, the live stream is still there. Or you can always go to my YouTube channel. It's just in my name, Bernardine Wormley Daniels. And all the old Bible studies are right there for your viewing and study. Study, um, okay? Um, just go and um, um, you can watch them anytime or listen anytime, um, any place. okay? So after we go off on Tuesdays, I always download it into my computer. Then I upload it onto YouTube. And my son has really be, been exhorting me to do some other things like branching out onto Instagram and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. So I'm trying to figure out how to do all of that. Okay, so we started Jude. We know that um, um, from a Hebraic perspective, the name of the book is actually Judah. That Judah is the author. Jude is like the Greek translation of the Jewish name Judah, which would have been his real name. Okay, this book is for everybody today. It was written around between 58 and 60 AD. Um, it was a letter to the Eastern Mediterranean Christian um, community um, and to all lovers of God. So that's you and I. Okay, and um, uh, let's see. All that other introductory material, I don't have time to go back over all of that. But this book, I, I'll, I'll reiterate this, the purpose for the book of Jude was to exhort believers to vigorously defend and contend for the beliefs that we cherish, okay? That makes it very pertinent for today because we are in a time where persecution is arising and it is becoming increasingly more politically incorrect to um, um, share the truth that is in the word of God. People are losing their jobs um, uh, all around the world, Christians being persecuted and it is encroaching on the United States of America, and definitely over in Canada as well, okay? And other areas around in um, East Asia, um, um, there's persecution. Um, that's very, very real. I'm sure that you could tell you about. 
Okay, listen. Um, so uh, that's the purpose. Um, defend and contend for the faith. All right, let's jump back in. Okay, we already went over verses. We, we were in verse eight. So I'm just going to read up to that point. So it reads Judah, Jude, a slave, which is a doulos. That is a term of an intense commitment to Jesus. When a person refers to themselves as a doulos, the word means slave. A lot of modern translations will translate it again as servant, but it's not just a servant. It is a bond servant, a love slave, somebody who has been set free by the master, but because of their, de their devotion to their master, they commit themselves to lifelong servitude to serve the master as a bond or a love slave. That is a doulos. All the apostles that wrote books in the New Testament canon of scripture, they all had this revelation and they referred to themselves as a doulos of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I might have to do a teaching on that sometime because that's how we should see ourselves as well. So Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, we established that um, James was one of Jesus' brothers and Jude was, uh, was the half brother or the, they were the sons of Mary and Joseph. Um, um, Jude does not boast in his relationship with Jesus because his brothers didn't receive him readily. They were not disciples. They obviously became um, disciples at some point after his uh, resurrection, uh, his crucifixion and resurrection. So in humility, he does not boast in that. He connects himself instead to um, his brother James, who was a leader in the church. Okay. Um, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. And you can look at those meanings in depth. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common, our shared salvation, or the shared way that Jesus rescued us, that he, he delivered us, that he saved us, okay? I felt the necessity. I was com compelled in, in distress. Um, that word carries, there's a distress, um, which is, pushing him to, to write. I felt the necessity to write to you, exhorting the calling you near, entreating, encouraging you to contend earnestly for the faith, okay? Um, to struggle for the faith, for the, the moral conviction of religious truth, to not be ashamed, as Paul would say, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Okay, what is this thing doing? It's trying to give me a hard time. There we go. Let's just give me a minute, guys. I'm going to have to um, play with this after. Okay, I lost your, your comments. Just give me a second. Let me figure out how to get it back up. Um, okay, come on, show me their comments so that it's interactive. That's how the enemy works. He's been working. Okay, there we go. He's been working overtime to try to try to keep us from flowing with the comments. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. So, beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, exhorting you that you contend earnestly for the faith, um, the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons, and this is, this is um, really the point of his letter right here, certain persons have crept in unnoticed 
um, they came in stealthily. They slipped in. You know, that's how the enemy, the devil rarely comes in um, showing himself for, for what he really is. They slept in, they, they snuck in stealthily. Um, so for certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long before marked out. In other words, they didn't catch God off guard because prophets long before had foretold that these people would creep in to the thing that God was doing for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn grace, who turn the grace of our God. Now, listen, we went over this more in depth last time. But this is happening in the church today. You have people who have crept into the church secretly. They come in um, to um, change, to turn, to pervert, to exchange, to transpose the grace of our God into sensuality, into excess, into shamelessness and lasciviousness, into these, these theologies that say that you can live in any kind of way and do any kind of thing and God loves you and you can still get in. Mm -mm. That's these people that crept in, okay? They've turned the grace of our God into sensuality and they deny, they disavow, they have rejected and refused our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And so, of course, there are um, you can find um, um, the scripture <clears throat> speaking to this in Romans chapter 6 and Titus 2 verses 11 through 14. We went over all that last time. Now I want to remind you, um, though you know all things, that Jesus, and this is important here for the people who have that once you saved, you always saved theology. I do not buy it, but... You know, I could be wrong. Let's see what the Bible says. Well, here's what Jude says. Jude says, I want to remind you, though you know all things, that Jesus, the pre-existent Christ, the, the pre-existent one before Jesus, before he came in the flesh, the, the one who was one in the Godhead, Jesus, having once saved a people out of the land of Egypt, or then, or whatever Egypt that you were in before you came to know him, um, subsequently destroyed. That is the Greek word apolumi. It means to put out of the way entirely. It is a metaphor that has to do with devoting or giving um, one over to eternal misery in hell. Okay, It means to perish, to be lost, to be ruined. So Jesus, having once um, saved and delivered, rescued a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently or thereafter destroyed, he gave them over to eternal misery, those who did not believe. This is not pistis, faith, the, the noun, this is pistuo in the, in the Greek. This is the verb form of the word, okay? So th these are those who do not put feet to their faith, who are not living what they say they believe. So th those who have not been persuaded, verb, I mean, they're, they're, they're actively, they have actively entrusted their spiritual well-being to Christ. That's what he's saying. That those who did not walk in that, maybe they had a mental ascent. Or they said, yeah, you know, I received Christ as Lord, but they wanted to keep tipping and dipping and slipping. They were not pisteuo or pistuo. They were not believing as in the verb form, okay? And so he said that he gave them over. He gave them over to Apolumi. He to devote, gave them over to hell, okay? And then verse six, and the angels, okay? Now he's getting ready to show a progression um, and so you have to take note of this to follow what he's talking about because he's comparing these non-believers, these angels, Sodom and Gomorrah. He's comparing all of these things you're going to see to the false teachers that are coming into the church. Okay, you guys with me? And angels who did not keep, that's the word tereo, who didn't guard, who didn't keep their eye on, who didn't attend to carefully, who did not keep the state in which they were created. That is a word for 
the world today because we live in a day and age where they're aggressively trying to legislate and push certain ideologies on Americans saying that you don't have to keep your um, or guard your first estate meaning if you're born a boy or you're born a girl you don't have to you don't have to keep that we can change it okay I'm I ain't making it up I'm just I'm reading it to you there were angels who did not keep and see I'm gonna do my class soon on as in the days of Noah and I'll show you more in depth I won't have the time in this class but to show you in depth how those angels did that because there was a, 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 a group of angels who did not keep, did not stay in their own domain, their arche, their first estate, their origin, their first place, how God created them. They didn't keep it. They didn't, they were tired of being watchers, angels. They were lusting after the daughters of men. And so they stepped out of their own domain Okay, so and angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned, that's the word apolepo, it means they left behind, they deserted, they forsook their rank, their, the created order in which they had been made. Okay, are you guys with me? They, they, they abandoned their proper abode, that which God had, had created them to dwell in, they abandoned it. Come on, listen, people. That's happening again. Listen, that's happening again. Okay. Um, oh, let, let me keep going. Oh, we'll never get done. Okay. So those who, who abandoned their proper abode, he has kept. He has, he has um, kept in eternal ideals, um, everlasting eternal that's forever and ever and ever listen don't listen to the false teachers that want you to think that eternity does not mean forever when you, these people who have this um universalism type theology um you know um oh what's that brother's name carlton pearson and that camp the gospel of inclusion um, that brother who used to be over in Grand Rapids, the white guy, I can't think of his name, left, moved to California, wrote this book called Love Wins. They teach this cheap grace. You know, they don't believe that eternity means eternity unless it pertains to life. But when it comes to separation from God, they want to change the definition. Listen, he has kept in eternal, everlasting bonds, Desmond shackles. Dis, an impediment or disability check meaning they they will not be able to get back from from what they changed they can't fix it there's no fixing it oh man we're gonna get to it in a minute enoch the book of enoch i got it with me today okay uh, and, and, I, and I'll show you, okay, because the, these angels, after they did what they did, according to the book of Enoch, they pleaded with Enoch to ask God to, you know, forgive them. Oh, it was too late. They, they couldn't get back. They were in eternal bonds under, dar under darkness. That's deep right there. Under Zophos, blackness, the darkness of the netherworld for judgment. I don't have to go there. I don't need to see it. I take God at his word. I'm taking him at his word. At under darkness for the judgment, that's krisis in the Greek, damnation, a separating trial, sentence of condemnation of the great day. So there is a great day coming, okay, where everything and everyone will be judged including these high ranking RK, these were principality level um, uh, angels that left their own domain. They abandoned their proper abode, their proper residence. And they're influencing the same ideology um, uh, demonic spirits, their offspring, um, in the world today. Okay, keep going. So we looked at this last time as well. You'll find these stories in depth of Genesis 6, 
verses 1 through 4, it will tell you how these angels, known as the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, that is a reference to angels when you see it in scripture, the Benai Elohim, they were eyeballing the daughters of men, and they took them um, unto themselves, and they um, um, birthed what was known as the Nephilim or the fallen one who were giants in the earth. And I go into great detail about that in my class. I will show you pictures of some of the fossil finds of big giant, like 35 foot uh, people. <laughs> okay, you know, this, this stuff. People say some of this stuff in scripture is mythology. I'm telling you it's for real. Ask First Nations people. First Nations people whose history has been passed down in the stories from their ancestors, from and they'll tell you. Second Peter 2, verses 4 through 8. And, and of course, um, Enoch. First Enoch. Okay, let me just let me just share it with you just because. Okay. If you are a bibliophile and you like reading this stuff now, these books are not in the Western canon of scripture or our 66 books of the, the Bibles. Um, um, but they these books were or are, I think, in the Ethiopian, like Orthodox um, canon of scripture. Um, and these books were considered... Um, but some of the ancient uh, church fathers thought this stuff was too deep for y'all to handle. I don't know why. But you can actually get a copy of the book of Enoch. This one is by Joseph Lumpkin. Uh, the books of Enoch, uh, the Watchers, the Angels, and the Nephilim. So it includes extensive commentary. It has the first book of Enoch, the second book of Enoch, and the third book of Enoch, the book of the fallen angels, the watchers and the origins of evil with expanded commentary. So what this author did is in the text, as you're reading through the book of Enoch, he will then insert references in your canon of scripture that shows you where the canon of scripture was making reference to the writings of Enoch, okay? Um, so it was a very well accepted uh, book back in the ancient days, and it is referenced numerous times in, um, in the Bible, okay? Um, it's quoted numerous times. So that's one version, the books of Enoch by um, Joseph B. Lumpkin. This one is really good, Dr. Michael Heiser. Dr. Michael Heiser, I think, died, unfortunately, um, earlier this year of cancer. Um, after, But he um, was a Hebrew scholar. He had a PhD in Hebrew and Semitic studies. Brilliant scholar. He does tremendous writings on the Hebrew scriptures and different, like, um, uh, Oh, um, the supernatural in the Hebrew scriptures, um, all that kind of stuff. He, he breaks it down. But these, these were not written for like theologians. He actually wrote these volumes for everyday ordinary people to understand the writings of the book. So it has a reader's commentary that includes his extensive work. I highly recommend it. A Companion to the Book of Enoch by Dr. Michael Heiser. Okay. Volumes one and two. There you go. Okay. So let's look at volume one and I'll just give you a peek see at first Enoch uh, 10 and show you what Jude is referencing. Okay, give me a minute because this has got lots of commentary in it. Okay, here we go. 10. All right. I'm just going to give you a teaser because it's too much to go into in this context. All right. So this is what Jude is referring to. This is from 1 Enoch, the 10th chapter, beginning at verse 1. Um... Oh, that's the commentary. I want the text. Then said the Most High, the Holy and Great One, he spoke and sent Uriel to the son of Lamech. Uriel is a 
high ranking angel that's not mentioned in our canon of scripture, but he is mentioned in um, the book of Enoch and probably in some of the apocryphal um, writings. Okay, and sent Uriel to the son of Lamech and said to him, go to Noah and tell him in my name, hide thyself and reveal to him the end that is approaching, that the whole earth will be destroyed and a deluge is about to come upon the whole earth and will destroy all that is on it. So the angel Uriel is going to Noah to tell Noah about you know what's getting ready to happen the flood and to instruct him that he may escape and his seed may be preserved for all the generations of the world. And again, the Lord said to Raphael, this is another high ranking, um, art, one of the, um, high ranking, good principality type, um, angels. Um, he's the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel. Azazel is one of the angels that fell hand and bind him hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert, which is in Dudael and cast him therein and place upon him. See, again, this is why you have people out in these dead, isolated wilderness places, digging, digging down into the ground, trying to tap into these portals and gates and things like that. They're going to open up something they don't want to see. Okay. So anyway, and place upon him rough and jagged rocks and cover him with darkness and let him abide there forever and cover his face that he might not see light. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into fire and heal the earth, which the angels have corrupted and proclaim the healing of earth. So he's going on, he's talking about what these um, fallen angels did. I'm going to skip over some stuff. It's very interesting. Um, but what Azazel did was Azazel disclosed and taught some of the secret dark arts to the sons of men. And that's how we got all this crazy stuff that's going on in the world. It goes all the way back to the days of Noah, you know, witchcraft and Satanism and all these kind of, you know, um, casting spells and that type of thing. You had fallen angels that taught um, men um, some of these dark arts. And to Gabriel said the Lord proceed, um, against the bastards and the reprobates and against the children of fornication and destroy the children of fornication and the children of the watchers from amongst men. Um, those are, they all died in the flood. Okay. And it goes on. He says, bind Simjaza, that's another fallen angel, and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And it goes on and it gives you detail. Okay. If you're interested in reading any of that stuff, okay, back to Jude, but that's what Jude was referring to. That these angels that were put under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Enoch does speak about that. And it was something that was known in the ancient church, in the ancient Jewish church, okay? Um, verse 7, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them having end up... Now look at this. Now, verse 7, of course, um, you'll have people, the people who argue for... Um, the whole LGBTQ, um, the whole thing that, and, and want to legalize it and say men can marry men, women can marry women, all that kind of stuff. They, in order to do that, if they are believers, there are certain passages of scripture, they try to change the meaning. So they'll tell you that Sodom and Gomorrah was not about the men wanting to rape the angels, okay, who, who looked like men. It wasn't about... Um, it, they say it was about hospitality, okay? Um, but let's see, look at this. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them having indulged in the same way these, okay? So you have to ask yourself, who is the these? What, wh who is the these referencing to? It says in the same way as these, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities around them having indulged in the same way as these is talking about the angels that they just referenced in verse number six, who left their first estate and did not maintain their proper abode, but begin to do all of these perverse things. He makes the comparison. Are you guys with me? And he says that Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them having indulged in the same way as these, meaning they're, 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 they're committing the same sin as these angels did. 
okay, in gross sexual immorality. It is the Greek word ekpornuo, is where we get pornography, you know, porno, that kind of thing. Ekpornuo, it means to give yourself over to fornication. Every imaginable type, every imaginable type of fornication outside of one man born a man, one woman born a man in the covenant of marriage. That's the only legal place of sexual expression in the scripture, okay? Now you can say you don't agree, but you cannot say that that's not what the Bible says because it does. And I'm telling you, these are one of the reasons why I studied and continue even now to be a member of the um, Bible Mastery Academy, uh, restudying the Greek and the Hebrew, because this stuff is important, particularly today. People will try to tell you the Bible says stuff that it doesn't say. And I can remember as a teenager, I can remember in the, as a kid in the Baptist church, the pastor would say certain things and I was just a kid and I didn't know why what he was saying wasn't right. But the Holy Ghost in me was telling me that ain't right. What he just said, don't be believe that, believe that, believe that, but don't believe that because it ain't right. So I made a decision that when I was able, I was going to study the languages so I could see what these things say. And this, you can look it up for yourself. I can recommend to you apps. You don't have to do it the hard way that I did when I was back in seminary. You can do it digitally. Now just click on a word and it'll pop up the Greek or the Hebrew and show you the usage and show you the meanings. These in, these in the same way as these in gross sexual immorality, ekpornuo, they were being utterly unchaste. It, it, essentially, it, it essentially means they were whores. I, listen, I'm just the messenger. Look at it in your notes. Ekpornuo, it means to give self over to fornication, to be utterly unchaste, to go a whoring. Okay, that's what the angels did. Holy angels left their first estate and was just whores. Sodom and Gomorrah, same thing. He's making a comparison. And having gone after pursued, followed, strange, that's heteros, it means other, different, strange, one not of the same nature, flesh, okay? So the angels were pursuing people, okay? Sodom and Gomorrah, same thing. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted these angels, they were going to rape them, and Lot said, no, no. No, he was trying. And so finally the angels pushed Lot aside and said, we got this. Okay. And they blinded them. The, oh, that story even goes deeper because the, the thing that lets you know that Lot's soul had been vexed and was being influenced by his surroundings was when he wanted to give his daughters to these men as if that was better. No, that was a gross um, that would have been a gross assault, just like with the angels. But in this case, with the angels, it was strange flesh. Okay. Sodom and Gomorrah, same thing. Strange flesh. Okay. It means that um, of, not of the same nature, um, physicality, passions. They were, they were just like um, no holes barred in Sodom and Gomorrah. Are exhibited. So these angels and Sodom and Gomorrah <clears throat> um, is they are exhibited as an example. That was cool offering your daughters. Yeah, that that was an atrocity. The Lord began to speak to my heart about that one day. I was studying that text, and He was showing me that that was an example of how Lot was being influenced, and that's why Abraham had to go and get Lot, rescue Lot out. Um, that and he showed me how Abram was Abraham was a type of Christ to Lot. He was sent in to deliver him out, even as Christ was sent in to deliver us out. And so, because Lot was being impacted by, and that's why here again the significance of this book 
that Jude is exhorting us to earnestly contend for the faith because we live in a day and age where we're being vexed by all the things that pop up on the, the little computers we carry around in our pocket known as cell phones, where you can access the world with the click and Facebook and Twitter, all these mediums are becoming increasingly more X-rated, if you haven't noticed. You, I mean, there's stuff that'll pop up and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? I'm telling you. And our children have access to these things with their little iPads and smartphones, that type of thing. It's the same thing happening again. And so he gives this example that in Sodom and Gomorrah, they, the Sodom and Gomorrah is listed as an example, a digma in the Greek, a specimen, a pattern in undergoing in, in um, the punishment, meaning that they're going to suffer punishment. They're going to suffer the punishment of a judicial decision and executed um, a sentence of punishment. Okay, just like the angels, so Sodom and Gomorrah. And then verse eight, yet in the same way, these men, so in other words, in the same way, these men, in the same way that the angels did what they had no business going after strange flesh, in the same way that Sodom and Gomorrah did, did, did the same thing, in the same way, he's making comparisons. Can you see that? Okay. These, I, I need you to see it because everything progresses off of that. And people like to excuse themselves from the narrative, particularly when they be tipping on the dark side and doing this stuff. They want to pretend like the Bible doesn't say that. But I find it interesting that the book of Jude is strategically placed in the canon of scripture right before the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's almost as like Jude is crying out, get this thing together now before this one comes back. Okay. Because he's coming. Okay. All right. So yet in the same way as the fallen angels, as the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, these men also by dreaming, look at this, look at this, by dreaming um, defile um, and reject, they defile the flesh and reject authority. I'm going to go back and break that down in a minute and blaspheme glorious ones. Okay. These men, comparing them to the angels and to Solomon and Gomorrah, dreaming, that's a very interesting word. It's a nupniazomai in the Greek. Don't worry about pronouncing it. Here's what it means. Filthy dreaming, okay? A metaphor, this word is used as a metaphor. It means to be beguiled with sensual images and carried away to an impious course of conduct. Sensual dreamers. So they're fantasizing all kind of filthy things, filthy dreams, and they're prophesying out of the filth. Listen, <laughs> I, you know what? I... I feel like we could just, we could close our Bibles. We, that's like enough for me, like, right, just for the day. I'm telling you, is that not deep? Is that not heavy? That hits me in a very, very heavy way because it's happening today. They're prophets, they're dreaming filthy. These are, they're being beguiled by their own sensual images, their own fantasy imaginations. They're being carried away by their sensual dreams and they're prophesying out of that and they're defiling the flesh of, of themselves and those who will listen to them. And they reject, they are they teo, they cast off, they despise, they disregard authority, the curioto, curiotes, they, the authorities, the, the ones who possess dominion and lordship, they reject authority, not only the authority of God, but the authority, not or the authority of Christ, the lordship of Christ, but the authority that 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 um, the Lord put in His church, they reject it. They cast it off. They disregard it, and they're prophesying out of their own perverse dreams and fantasies, 
and calling it the voice of the Lord. False prophets, false teachers. Listen, that's why you need to get you a Bible. I mean, you, you need to get one that you can read, okay? And if you're not sure about the legitimacy of it, just message me. Say, hey, listen, I bought blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> I'll tell you, I'll be happy to tell you, you know, what I, what I think about it. Um, or you can, you can, I'm telling you, it matters, okay? <clears throat> because these people were false prophets, false teachers, dreamy, filthy, sensual, impious stuff, prophesying out of it, defiling not only their own flesh, but rejecting in the process, um, despising the authority, the dominion, and the lordship of the Lord and his delegated authority, and blaspheming. They were speaking reproachfully. Um, uh, they were reviling, speaking evil of glorious ones. That's the word doxa in the Greek. It, so this could mean things belonging to Christ, meaning they were blaspheming the, the um, divine order that God had put in the church. Because remember, these are false teachers and false prophets. They're trying to pull people away. So they were blaspheming the doxa, the things belonging to Christ, his fivefold ministry, his structure, it could mean that. It could also be a reference to the angels, to the to the, 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 the stuff that's going on in the spirit realm, the Holy Spirit and the angels of God that no doubt were trying to constrain them. They were blaspheming, speaking evil of it and, and, and casting it off because they wanted to do what they wanted to do. Are you guys tracking with me? Is there everybody with me? And so what Jude is saying, let me know in the comments if you're, if you're tracking with me. Verse 9, um, but Michael, the archangel, just to show you that there is a, there's protocol, there's, um, there's a way to do things in the kingdom of God, okay? But Michael, the archangel, he's the archangelos in the Greek, he's the chief of angels, when he... <clears throat> was disputing or contending with the devil, who is Lucifer, who is a fallen archangel, um, a fallen one of the um, the anointed cherub. He was a cherubim. Oh man, we one day we we'll, we'll do a study on it. Okay, we we just can't go into it right now. But um, um, Michael was contending with the devil. He was arguing about the body of Moses. Now this, um, this I don't think is in our scripture. It might be pulled from like the Assumption of Moses or Book of Jubilees or one of those things. But that the people did adhere to and that they believed was, um, um, you, could, was you could use it for reference purposes. So Michael the archangel with the devil was arguing about the body of Moses. But Michael did not dare pronounce against him or against Lucifer a blasphemous judgment, an insult or slander. In other words, he wasn't playing the dozens with, with Lucifer. Yeah, well, your mama is, yeah, well, your mama's blah, blah, blah. No, he, they, he wasn't doing it. Michael didn't lose himself in the contention, okay? He didn't lose, he didn't forget that he was an archangelos. He was an archangel, Michael, you know, come on, the chief of the angels. He's the prince of Israel. <laughs> My fire ESV commentary of Jude says the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Praise God. You got a good, you got a good Bible study, a uh, study Bible. Okay. So he did not dare pronounce against him a blasphemous judgment. He didn't insult, he didn't stoop to that level. This, this, is an, this is an example for us to follow. When people are coming against you, when they're contending with you, you don't have to go low like them. You go high and get in your seat in heavenly places and don't forget who you are. But Michael did not dare pronounce against him a blasphemous judgment. In other words, he didn't stoop to his level, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. That word rebu rebuke is epi epitimao, epitimao. It means the Lord 
um, forbid you, the Lord forbid, the Lord admonish you, the Lord charge you, the, the Lord will censure you. <laughs> In other words, he was letting them know, devil, you ain't getting away with it. The Lord has got your number. Man, you, the Lord has got, I have seen what's going to happen to you in the end. See, that he just went there. Okay, Michael had a measure of respect for spiritual powers, even towards the crazy devil. And what that means is he didn't let the devil pull him out of his place of divine authority and service to the king. It's the same thing that Jesus did when he was before the religious leaders, when they were ripping the hair out of his beard and spitting on him and, you know, trying him and lying on him and sent him to Pilate. And he never spoke a harsh word. He never forgot who he was. Whew. Boy, that was for somebody right there that had oil on it. He didn't let the conflict cause him to forget who he was. He maintained his integrity and he endured because he knew what was on the other side of his suffering. Maybe that was for me. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Praise God. Okay, let's keep going. So you can look at these passages of scripture um, and they will um, give you uh, references to Michael. Okay, verse 10. But these men, talking about these false teachers, false prophets, these men blaspheme the things which they do not understand. Oida. They don't know. They, they don't have the, the knowledge that they think they have. You know, I think I told you guys I was listening to... Um, I was listening to this brother who has kind of like a talk show. He he kind of um, spews all the gossip and stuff. You know, sometimes I can deal with it. Other times I'm like, oh, I, I can't handle this guy. I can't listen to him for long. But sometimes he's interesting. He was interviewing uh, Carlton Pearson. The interview was almost three hours. So I had it on like while I was cleaning up and I was listening while I was working. And Carlton Pearson, they got to talking about eternity and hell because Carlton Pearson, of course, who used to be a Pentecostal tongue talking, fire baptized preacher, you know, slipped over to the other side. And so whereas he used to preach hell, now he doesn't believe in hell. So he made this statement and see, this is an example of these men blaspheming things which they do not understand or they don't know. Um, he said, hell is not something a, not a place where people go to. Hell is something people go through. See, because he doesn't believe in hell. So he thinks that everybody, regardless of how they live, what they do, Hitler, all the crazy people, all, all the crazy people, mass murderers, everybody who never confess Christ, who live like the devil, who worship Satan, all that kind of stuff, everybody's going to heaven. That, that's literally what he believes. He said, hell is what you go through on this side. The devil is a liar. There is a place, honey. Jesus talked about it. All right. These men blaspheme the things which they do not know. Oida. And the things which they know, epistamai, the things which they do comprehend and do understand by instinct. Like unreasoning animals, <clears throat> like absurd, like destitute of reason animals. By these things, they are destroyed. <clears throat> that word means ruined. They perish. They are defiled. They think they're smart. They try to sound astute. They, they try to sound deep. Oh, this is a, a deep revelation. No. Woe to them, verse 11. For they have gone. Now, now listen, people. I want you to hear this verse. Because I've been praying. I, I've been praying about this stuff right here. Woe to them, these, who is them, the, the false teachers, the false prophets, these false pastors, these people that are coming in and doing what God said don't do, okay, for their own gain. Woe to them, 
for they have gone the way of Cain, okay, and for pay, circle for pay, they have poured themselves into, they bestow or they distribute largely the error. They poured themselves into, boy, I can feel the anointing coming in on this verse right here. They run greedily out. They, they have gone the way of Cain, and, and, and I'll go back and explain what that means. And for pay, they have poured themselves into the error, the error, the plane, the of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now, what does that mean? Now, of course, Jude presupposes that his audience, who is like Eastern um, uh, Christian Jewish community who knew the Tanakh or the Hebrew scriptures or what we call the Old Testament, the way of Cain. What was Cain's error? Cain rejected the blood sacrifice that God desired. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? God had determined how the people were to bring a sacrifice after the man and the woman sinned and they were separated from God. Now in order to approach God, there has to be a sacrifice without the shedding of blood. See, there's, there's no reunion. That's why Jesus came to be the sacrifice. Okay, but prior to Christ, the people had to bring a blood sacrifice. Cain didn't do that. Cain brought what he wanted to bring. Remember, Abel brought the first of his flock. He brought a blood sacrifice. And Cain just picked a few vegetables or, or fruit or whatever and, and brought that and thought, well, I'll give him what I want to give him. And God wasn't pleased. He didn't receive Cain's sacrifice. Remember that? And so Cain's countenance fell. He was mad at his brother and went out in the field, killed him, rose up and killed him. Now, up until that point, <clears throat> the scripture doesn't indicate that anybody had died physically. This is the first murder. OK, so maybe he didn't understand the full extent of what would happen if he if he clobbered his brother in the back of the head with something out in the field and, and kill. But he killed him. God comes, remember, and, and pursues him. Hey, Cain, what's wrong with your face? What have you done? Your, bro your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So blood speaks. Blood speaks. OK, um, what's this verse again? Uh, which verse are you making reference to? Right now, I'm in Jude. It's only one chapter. I'm on verse 11. Jude, verse 11. Okay, I'm not, I'm sure, Rebecca, if you're talking about something else, just clarify. Okay, so they've gone the way of Cain. That means they have rejected the blood sacrifice and, listen, that means they will bash you in the back of the head for their own profit. <laughs> they could care less if you die the way of Cain. Oh man, I could break that down for you. Because when you study that in the, in the Hebrew, when Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? When you look at that in the Hebrew and you look at the pictographic meaning of the word brother and keeper, oh yeah, the word brother in and of itself, in and of itself means that you're a fence or you protect the, the, that one that is your physical brother. You're a fence around him. So yes, you were supposed, the, the word brother means that you were supposed to keep him. Okay, so they've gone that way. That means they really don't care about you. Okay, look. And that's one thing that these false teachers, these, these false teachers, they really don't care. They reject the blood sacrifice. That means they have rejected Christ. That means that there is no atonement for their sins because they have rejected the only atonement that was available for them. Okay. And for pay, circle pay, they have poured themselves into the era of Balaam. Now, what did ba false teachers will insist on adding something to the gospel, polluting it with human works. Balaam's error was an abuse of the prophetic gift. Again, boy, that's got oil on it for financial gain. You need to, cause we don't have time. I dare you to go read numbers chapters 22 through 24 
and then look at Numbers 31 and verse 16, okay? Balaam, now we have people today, they will sell their prophetic gift. I have been places where they bring in prophets, these big name prophets, and they, they, they start with the lines. This is the $50 line, $100 line, $500 line, $1,000 line. You put $50 in the prophet's hand and he gives you a, a prophecy depending on the size of your, your gift. Okay. Let, okay. Let me just look down into my Bible. So they sell, they sell the gift. Balaam. That in the church today, we have people, they sell, we sell the gospel. We sell everything. We charge people. Listen, and I, let me just, just hear my confession. I really, really, really wrestle with this. I, I really wrestle with it. Particularly because, you know, I'm no longer employed by the church that I served for like 11 years. Okay. Um, and that's another story as to what I think about the way that was done. But here's the thing. It takes money to run a ministry when you're called to ministry, This is what I do full time. And so I know because I've been doing this since I was what, 23, 24, and I will 24 I will be 63 this year, so, I, so I, I've been doing this a long time. So I have participated in and I have seen how the church pimps the people and how the church sells everything. We sell healing ministry. We make people pay to come in to be for healing prayer. We make people pay for deliverance ministry. We put on these conferences and we make people pay to come and sit and hear the word of God. We make people pay for prophet. We sell everything. When God, so I've been asking God because I'm like, Lord, okay, come on, it's me and you. We're doing this full time. I, I got to live. I have a mortgage, I, but I refuse. That's why you guys come online. The notes are there outlines the stuff that people would put in a book and make you pay $20, $30 to get it. It's just on my Facebook page for, fit for free because the Lord determined that his church and the clergy, the Levites today, would be supported through the tithes and offerings of the people. The tithes and offerings so I personally, maybe I'm just not business savvy because I know people who charge big, fat honorariums. They won't even come to your church and preach unless you kick out a minimum of about $3,000 a message, okay, or for the, 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 the time that they're there. That we, we have, wait, wait let, me, let me just get off my little soapbox. I'm praying about it, okay, just... Ask the Lord to give me clarification because I have a hard time with it. I know, I mean, I've got all kinds of ideas and things I want to write and do. And I know that it's worth, it's worth my time and, and the knowledge that I would put into it. I just have a hard time selling the ministry when God intended that the tithes and the offerings were supposed to be that which supported um, the the Levites. Okay, so I'm I'm praying about it. Okay, so that's why, like, if I do a workshop or something, usually I will say registration is free, or we ask you to give a twenty dollar love offering to help me print the manuals and things that you're going to need for because if our ministry does it, if I take it to like, you know, um, um, what is it, um, FedEx to be printed. Oh man, that map, those manuals can cost like up to 20, 30 bucks each if I have them done in color and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it takes money, but I don't want to be guilty of the error of Balaam 
Balaam's error was an abuse of the prophetic gift, or you could just say ministry gift for financial gain. So it's just something for us to think about. It's something not only for the leaders to think about, but for the people in the church to think about. Because people in the church will take their money all, every, all kind of places and spend it. They'll spend $50 at the gas station buying lottery tickets. <laughs> Woo, buying lottery tickets and go to church and, and then put in one of what I call one of those Trinity offerings, which is a dollar for the Father, a dollar for the Son, and a dollar for the Holy Ghost. Okay, uh, Numbers 31 and 16. Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the word of Balaam to act unfaithfully against Yahweh in the matter of Peor. So the plague was among the congregation of Yahweh. So in other words, yeah, you have to read the whole story in Numbers. Yeah, he, he, he pimped his gift. Balaam is known as a false prophet. And this, you should hear this, not because he couldn't prophesy. He, he, he could hear. He knew how to hear and get a word of God from, from God. He was called a false prophet because of his character and because of how he pimped and he sold his gift. Okay, let's go on. And then also these perished in, they, they, um, they've gone after um, the rebellion of Korah. Remember Korah and Dathan? You got to go back to the Moses and the Exodus days. Um, Korah and Dathan. Korah led 250 men in rebellion against the leadership of Moses. And the earth opened up and swallowed Korah, his family, everybody that was stood with him. Earth opened up and swallowed them alive. Okay. And so in the same way, here's what Jude is trying to get us to see. In a similar way, the things of this earth entice false teachers, entice false prophets and the leaders that Jude is warning us against. And they're swallowed up by their greed. They're swallowed up by their um, desire to prosper. And they, they're swallowed up um, by their greed for what this world can offer. You know, everybody wants to, you know, be successful. We, we all want to be able to pay our bills and, and, you know, be able to have the things that we want and be a blessing to our family and, and a blessing to others. You know, but there's a way that God would have us um, to do things, the scripture says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Okay, let's keep going with Jude. Let's see, what you guys say? Um, the tithes need to cover the priest's needs. Yeah, the, the priest and the Levites um, and the, the musicians, they were all to be, that's, don't let me go up that bunny trail. Because a lot of churches, they want all those people to be volunteer. They want you to bring your gifts in. They, you have these one or two elite people, they're paid, and they want the best musicians and the best praise team. And that, <clears throat> but they don't want these people to live off of their gift. They want you to give your gift. That was not the, the, the model that, that, go back and look at it in, in the organ. David commissioned priests and Levites to sing and praise God and play 24-7 and they were paid through the tithes and offerings of the people. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 12, these men, these false teachers, false preachers, could be men, I should say these people because it could be more than just men, um, are hidden reefs Listen, that is a metaphor for people who by their conduct damage others morally and cause you to shipwreck, as it were. Because if you're in a boat and there's a hidden reef and you hit it, you're going to shipwreck. So following false teachers, false prophets, the, that's why 
That's another reason why I like to hand out notes so that you can try the spirit. You can go over these notes after we're off the air. You can sit down with your Bible, try the spirit, see whether or not it be of God. If I missed it, if I'm wrong, I'll come back and say, you know what? I'm not sure that that's right. Maybe let's look at that again, you know, or, but you, you want to make sure that the table that you're eating from is not giving you food laced with arsenic, okay? So these were the, the false the false teachers, prophets, etc., are hidden reefs. They will shipwreck your faith. They're shipwrecks, I mean, they're hidden reefs in your love feasts. That's talking about the, the communion table. The, they, they did it differently than we do it um, in a lot of churches today. The, the, the church gathered around that meal in the ancient church love feast they came together as a community of faith they remembered the sacrifice of jesus christ um, and they prayed for and supported one another in your love feast when they feast with you without fear caring for themselves as poimino it means to tend to feed these men were feeding themselves they were looking out for themselves looking out for number one okay um, clouds without water, that's a sad thing because water or rain, whew, this has the anointing on it too. In the Bible is a symbol of re revelatory teaching. These people come in wanting to sound deep, but they're like clouds without water. They, they, they carry no true revelation. I was, like I said, I was listening to Carlton Pearson I think that guy's name is Larry Reed. He was interviewing him and Larry Reed kept saying, man, you smart, man, you smart. And, 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 I, and I was thinking to myself, woo, hidden reefs, clouds without water. See, sounds deep, but it's, it's not real revelation. Carried along by the winds, autumn trees without fruit. There should be, where there should be beauty, the false teachers are instead barren of real godly fruit. They, they are autumn trees that have no fruit. Now look, this, this, is, this is an expression, this whole section just kind of, if it doesn't provoke some fear and reverence for God, it should in your life. It does for me because I'm in ministry and I do this for a living. So you don't want to be in this in the category that's being described. At least you, I don't. Jude calls them doubly dead, double dead, dead in appearance, dead in their inner man, doubly dead. That's bad. That that's bad. And I also think that that has to do with. These were people who maybe started in Christ. They got caught up in the hype. They got caught up in the money. They got caught up in the, the sex and all of the perverse things that their imaginations and they died to Christ. So they were dead in sin. They came to Christ. They died again, doubly dead. That, that, that's bad. That's just my own. I could be wrong about that, but that's just one way that I look at that text. Um, uprooted, wild wave, verse 13, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame. That means they're foaming out shameless deeds, casting up their own shame like foam. I mean, it just, they spew it everywhere they go. It just rolls out of them. They are wandering stars it's the Greek word planetes, an erratic teacher. They're erratic. <clears throat> Look at this. The scripture says, the black darkness, the black darkness has been reserved for them forever. The blackness of darkness. That is a word in the Greek. It's the word skotos. It means obscurity has been reserved for them. It is a, skotos is a metaphor for ignorance respecting divine things 
and the accompanying ungodliness and immorality together with their consequent misery in hell. In other words, black darkness means that they, they just will be ignorant concerning true divine things because God is gonna give them over. Remember, that's what Paul said in Romans, that he'll give them over to that crap that they, they want to spew, they want to espouse. At a point, he, he'll, he'll give them over to that. And so um, that ignorance is going to, of course, the consequence will be misery in hell. Persons in whom darkness becomes visible, skotos. That means that when people, we should, if we walk in the light, we should see darkness when we run into it. You can see it on people's countenance. Have you ever looked at somebody and you could just see the darkness coming through their countenance? I've had experiences like that where you could see they carry it. You could see the darkness on them. So look at this. Persons in whom this word skotos means that the darkness becomes visible. It becomes visible in their character. It'll become visible in their life. You can just see it. You can hear it. Just turn on the news. Turn on, oh man, I could, I could name some news networks. You could turn on if you want to hear and see the darkness. It's just overt. It is overt. Go on YouTube and click around. Go on TikTok. Okay, let me come back. And um, this is Skotos. Darkness becomes visible and holds sway. It is a Hebraic expression that is meant to convey the place of future eternal punishment. It is the farthest away from God that anyone could ever be. I do not want to be in the blackness of darkness. In, in Skotos, that, that's Skotos. I, I, I don't want to see that. That place has been reserved for false teachers and false prophets forever. You cannot play games with God. This thing is not a game that we do, okay? Uh, wandering stars. Let's look at that word stars again, um, just so, so you can see what it means by wandering stars. Uh, in the ancient church, stars were seen as navigational tools for seamen or sailors, okay? They didn't have a GPS system like we do, so they used the stars to navigate. And, but these false teachers could not be dependent on and would give disastrous guidance. So that's why they called them wandering stars. You couldn't like follow the stars and it leads you to life. They're like wandering stars. They're going to lead you off course. Okay. That's what that meant. Okay. Um, 14. Oh, come on. Uh, we are not. <laughs> I thought we was going to get to verse 25 today, but we're not. But Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam, also prophesied about these men, saying, behold, this is almost a direct quote from um, 1 Enoch um, chapter 1, verse 9. Almost a direct quote. Um, um, Jude quotes it, and so does um, Peter. And I think in 2 Peter, Peter quotes it. Behold, <clears throat> The Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh, violent, offensive, intolerable things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That is almost a direct quote from Enoch chapter 1, verse 9. I'm going to read it to you. This is out of the book of Enoch. And behold, he cometh with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So it's almost a, a direct quote from um, the book of Enoch. Verse 16, these are grumblers, gogustes in the um, Greek, um, discontentedly complaining against God. They hate the true word of God. They, they, they do not like the scripture, see? 
the word of God. They're grumbling. They, they, they complain against God. Finding fault. Where was God when this blah, 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 blah? Why didn't God do blah, 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 blah? Grumblers. Finding fault. It's a Greek word that means they're complaining. They're blaming. They're, they're always discontent. Following after their own lust. Epithemia. Epithumia. Epithumia. Um, it means longings for what is forbidden, cravings, concupiscence, sexual desires, physical attractions. They just go for, <clears throat> they're, the, they're the people that want to convince you that love is fluid. Oh, love is fluid. No, it's not. It should be fluid towards your spouse. Okay, okay, let me come back. They're grumblers. They find fault, lust. This is longing for what is forbidden, cravings, um, concupiscence, sexual desires, physical attractions. And their mouth speaks arrogantly. That means just what it says. It, it, it translates just like that in the Greek. Flattering people. In other words, they use seductive flattery and admiration for their own personal financial gain. They talk a good game. They want to draw you into it. Flatter, 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 but it is for their pockets. It's for their game. They use you until they get what they want, and then they discard you. They flatter for the sake of their own benefit. When they're flattering you, speaking well of you, it is rarely about you. It is usually about them. They flatter for the sake of their own benefit, ophelia, their own advantage and profit. I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what these words mean in the original language. So at this point, Jude begins to tell us we need to keep ourselves, okay? But you, beloved, that's you and I, we must remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, remember the rhema. Remember the prophetic utterances. Remember the way that Christ spoke through his apostles, okay? You want to remember it? Pick up a Bible and read it. Read the epistles. Read, read the letters that they wrote, and you'll see how God spoke through them. That they were saying to you in the last time, this the last day started at Pentecost. So from the time of Pentecost on, there will be mockers, impike, impike taste. Um, mockers, it means false teachers, scoffers, people that just twist the word. They keep what they want. They toss out the parts that don't fit their agenda. Following after their own ungodly lust. That means just what it says, ungodly lust. These are the ones they cause divisions. And I thought this was interesting. Oh, we got like two minutes. Let me, let me show you verse 19. These are the ones who cause divisions. They're worldly mind minded. This is the word sukikos or psychikos. Psychikos. They're crazy. Okay. <laughs> okay. They're psychic. They're, they're, they're psychotic. Okay. Psychikos. Okay. These are the ones who cause divisions. They are worldly mind minded. It means sensual. They're subject to appetite and passion. Everything that they're preaching and teaching is usually about their appetites and their passions. They do not have the spirit. But you, beloved, but you building yourselves up. It's a Greek word. <laughs> My brain is looking at the clock and I can't get it out. Epoikodomeo. Um, building yourself up to, it means to give a constant increase in Christian knowledge and in a life conformed there too, to build up. So you're building yourselves up on your most holy faith. You're building yourself up in the word. As you study the word, you're building yourself up. Okay. You and I, we're to build ourselves up in this word. We're to increase in our knowledge of Christ and our knowledge of the word or uh, building ourselves up on our most holy faith. And, and then also praying prosukomai. That is a worshiping kind of prayer. It's a worshiping prayer. So we build ourselves up on the word and, and building up our faith, praying, worshiping God, praying in this, the Greek word, ain, 
Oh, I'm out of time. I'm sorry. I'm going to break that down for you because a lot of people think that praying in the spirit means praying in other tongues. And it can mean that, but it means that and more than that. Okay. But we will pick it up right there next time. You have been watching the Living Water live stream Bible study. Listen, I love faith is like, keep going, keep going. Oh, you know what? I don't know if I can do that. I've never gone beyond an hour and a half. We're almost done. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 I will finish it next time. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll finish it next week. We will finish this and be ready to jump into first John, first John. We're going to read that. I've been um, reading and studying that in my um, biblical mastery class. Once you go through that year of Greek, one of the first books they give you to read is John's epistles because his writing in the Greek is very simple. His writing is not like Paul. It's like having somebody who is like a, um, a junior high school graduate um, and the writings of somebody who has a PhD in, in ministry or Hebrew scriptures or something like Paul. So Paul's letters are harder to read. But we're going to pick this up, beloved. Listen, God loves you guys. He really does. And so do I. And tell your friends and your neighbors to get the notes, watch the stream, study, study with us the book of Jude. We're almost done. And then we're going to jump into John next week. I'll see you the same time, God willing. Um, take care and God bless.